Hey, what's going on everybody? So, I'm doing a uh, spark plug replacement on my 2012 Wrangler. Uh, this has the Pentastar. Uh, I guess they had to really shoehorn this thing in. Um, and the reason why I'm doing a video on what would normally be a very basic job is because the left cylinder bank is totally blocked due to the position of the intake manifold or the shape of the intake manifold. Passenger side cylinder bank, all the coils are right there. Um, you know, like I said, the uh, left bank totally blocked off, so the upper plenum has to come off with the throttle body, all that kind of stuff. So I figured this would be a pretty good video to do. Parts are going to need to do the job. They're going to need to do a plenum set or a plenum gasket set. Uh, that is the part number. They come prepackaged in six. And uh, these are the plugs I'm using. There's a lot of options. Uh, but the factory plug is basically a Champion uh, Iridium. I've always kind of been a big proponent of putting back in the car what comes out. So uh, this is what I'm putting in. The part number, or at least the Champion number, is 9704, I believe. You don't have to go with me on that. It's 9704. That's the part number for the plug. Uh, and that's an RER 8 something something something. It's going to be the same information that's already on the factory plugs installed. Those are the same things you will buy from the dealership. So, uh, save yourself some money, just buy the Champion Iridiums, you can pretty much buy them anywhere. Let me get started on the passenger side or right bank first, that's the easiest. Uh, before doing anything electrical, you know, kind of a safety precaution, we're just going to take off the negative battery terminal. Uh, it is a 10 millimeter nut. There you go. And just put that off to the side, that way... You don't want the risk of shorting anything or messing anything up. Uh, right there, uh, we got our coil packs. There's one, there's two, there's three. That's not the number of cylinder they correspond with, but that's just simply, you know, where they're located. They're right on top of the valve cover. Um, <clears throat> so fairly, at least on this side, I don't think it's going to be too bad. Like I said, um, the left bank or driver's side bank, that's going to take uh, a little bit more work to get done. All right, so after you get that ground terminal off the battery, uh, the next step, uh, you have a vacuum line that runs along here. If you have a, uh, a metal panel tool, you just want to pop it off. There you go. Just held in with a kind of a crappy expanding rivet but you kind of want it out of the way when you're doing this so just get that out of the way and uh, we're gonna move on for next there. step I'm gonna pull out the uh, forward coil pack here I'm gonna remove uh, the nuts here that secure the coil pack in place to the valve cover uh, it's just 10 millimeters so nothing exceptional on that end you don't really need any special hardware or anything like that there's gonna be one uh, bolt for each ignition coil it just secures it to the valve cover very basic a lot of vehicles are like that if this is your you ever done spark plugs before on a, a coil on pack system or a direct ignition coil system a lot of them are held in with some sort of bolt just keeps it from uh, falling off the plug all right now it comes time to pull your coil packs out uh, what seems to be interesting on this is you can actually pull the coil out without disconnecting the electrical connector. The, the boot is pliable enough, or the spark plug connector is pliable enough that you can just basically pull them out. See what I mean? See how flexible it is? It just comes right out. Uh, that's kind of nice, I'm not gonna lie. And uh, the boots themselves, or the, the coils themselves, should come out fairly easily. Uh, sometimes these things do get kind of stuck on, but Like I said, they just kind of pop right out. Alright, so I have removed all of the coil packs here. Now, now is a great time to look down the holes of each spark plug tube and confirm that there's no oil that's pulled down there. You want to make sure these are clean because if oil is collecting in here, then you know 
valve cover gaskets are going to be on your list of things to do. Can't show you that back one. That one's kind of hard to to see, but it's clean and uh, looks like. Yep. This one. They're also. This one's hard to see too, but those are all clean, so that makes me feel good. Now I can just go about uh, pulling these spark plugs out and get them swapped. That's going to be next. I think a 5 8 spark plug socket. Now, in my opinion, magnetic spark plug sockets are the best, um, strictly because the ones that have the rubber boot inside of them, uh, the rubber boot tends to get kind of uh, stuck on the spark plug. But there we go. Car looked like it was actually running pretty. Good. I mean, actually, I, got, I can't. I got to be honest. Uh, this. Jeep has run spectacularly. I've put 60,000 miles on it in two years and um, it uh, it just keeps on ticking. Maintenance has been fairly low. Um, of course if you watch my 60,000 mile review which uh, is a video that I uploaded before this um, you know the only issue I had is uh, both catalytic converters failed uh, but it's a Chrysler product so what can you expect? Hate to say it but they have not been uh, known very well for good catalytic converters but that was under warranty hopefully it ends up not being an issue ever again and like I noted earlier uh, I like to make sure that whatever I put back in is the exact same plug that came out this is the plug that was removed so clearly it's a champion RER 8ZWY CB4 uh, this is what you would buy from Chrysler and now I think it says Mopar on it, I think. Um, I did originally get Mopar plugs because uh, the ones I ordered, I don't know, it was a mistake. They sent me the wrong ones. They were way more expensive. It was actually a total waste of money. Um, also, the Mopar plugs, if you buy them from the dealer, they don't have a protective sleeve over the end. Now, these are right out of the Champion box, and look at that. It says Champion. RER8ZWYCB4 and they put a plastic protector over it which more or less ensures that the spark plug gap um, doesn't get altered uh, when it's being shipped or, or transferred or whatever it's always good to check the spark plug gap before you install um, that's just really to make sure that you get optimum engine performance the reason why you have to replace spark plugs is over time the gap between the ground electrode uh, actually increases just simply from wear. Um, you know, I'm actually interested to see what these are like. So this is an 80,000 mile plug. They're supposed to be done 96,000 miles or they're good for 100,000 miles. I, I don't really like letting it run that long. So let's just see what the gap on this is versus the gap on the new one. So here's the new one. Uh, this is your typical spark plug gapper. Nothing special. So it looks like this is coming in at uh, 040, which uh, I'm going to have to check the spec, but I believe it's where it's supposed to be. Let's check this one. Oh. The spark plug gap on the spark plug I removed already. Oh, we'll try this again. It's like 046, 047. Uh, so that means over 80,000 miles, uh, the gap on this plug is opened up just simply because the tip uh, wears down over time, and that's why you have to replace these things. I guess technically you would regap them if you wanted to, but that's just a waste of time. Might as well put new ones in. I'm going to go ahead and just check the factory gap spec. I believe these are already pre gapped, but it doesn't hurt to check.
And I like to start threading these in by hand first, uh, just to get them going. You know, don't use, I mean, I suppose you probably use like an electric tool just to thread them in once you start getting them threaded. Um, but I would not use like any kind of pneumatic tool or, or anything like that to remove or install. It's kind of unnecessary. All right, so according to the factory service manual, I'm going to do a couple talking points though. So, uh, number one, if you have compressed air, um, blow any debris that might be inside of the spark plug tube out. However, uh, with this rubber boot right here that's on the plug or on the coil, I don't really see how any debris could ever make it down there. So I think check to make sure it's clean first. If there's no oil or any kind of debris down there, you can safely remove the plug. I wouldn't really worry about that too much. Uh, the second part of this too is you want to make sure that you use a relatively thin spark plug socket because the spark plug tubes are so thin. Uh, if you use a fatter one and try to shove it down there, you can damage the spark plug tube walls and that can cause leaking. Another thing to note as well is the spark plug torque spec on the Pentastar engine. Uh, this is directly from the factory. It's either 18 newton meters or 13 foot pounds of torque. Uh, a lot of fasteners you don't have to worry about the torque specification on, uh, but spark plugs, I would absolutely make sure that you do this. Uh, really you don't want to over tighten them and you don't want to under tighten them. If you over tighten them, uh, you know, you could strip out the uh, threading in the cylinder head. If uh, you under tighten them, the spark plug will literally pop back out, take all the thread with it. You'll be paying for an expensive repair of the cylinder head, uh, which is not a good thing. So this is an early Christmas present for my girlfriend, uh, but this is a micrometer torque wrench, 3H drive. Uh, it is good from, let's see. 25 inch pounds to 250 inch pounds or 3.6 newton meters all the way up to 29.1 newton meters. I'm going to go with the newton meter setting just because I don't want to convert to inch pounds. You know, make sure you're using a really good torque wrench or a quality torque wrench. I mean, sure, a Craftsman, probably not uh, your top of the line or most accurate wrench, but I think it's going to be accurate within reason. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and torque this down. See right there, you want to make it nice and smooth on that final turn. You can usually feel a fastener getting tight. Uh, and as it's getting tight, that's when you know uh, you've reached your final torque spec. Um, you know, you want to be smooth on your arcing motion. You don't want to be jerky. And uh, once you hit, uh, once you hit uh, that torque spec, that's when you know you're done. So again, you know, the finer talking points, 040 is your spark plug gap, uh, 18 newton meters or 13 foot pounds is your, is your spark plug torque. Make sure you have a good spark plug socket and uh, that's pretty much how you're going to do it. I'm going to finish up with all the uh, spark plugs on this bank and we're going to have to move over to this side and show you how to remove the upper plenum to gain access uh, to the spark plug. So I'm going to work on this side for now and I'll be back here in a minute. All right. Uh, so now that we got the right cylinder bank, uh, which I believe is bank one, uh, now we're moving over to the left cylinder bank, which is bank two. Like I said earlier, we got to take this upper plenum off. Um, this could be a nightmare. I haven't done it before, so this is my first time doing it. It'll probably be your first time doing it if you're watching this video. Um, so I'm going to try to do it right. Um... So let's get uh, let's get started on this bad boy. Although the good news is I don't think we're gonna have the same clearance issues getting spark plugs, especially towards the back on this side. I know famous last words. Start off with an eight millimeter. Just gonna loosen these.
All right, so there's three of those. You got to pull them up. All right, so underneath right here, there's a little plastic rivet. There's two of them. This kind of holds this foam insulation piece in place. And that's going to give us access to two 10 millimeter fasteners. I'm moving my tray over here though. Doesn't serve more purpose over there. I like to try to keep hardware with the pieces when I remove them. That way when you go to reinstall, you know what they were associated with. That hurt. I think at this point, we can get the foam out of here, I think. Yep, we can. To be honest with you, I don't, I don't really think I'm going to put this back in. I don't, I don't know what the purpose of that is. To, to be in the way, I guess. All right, so we got two vent hoses that we got to remove. Your favorite pick tool. Kind of work it under so they come off. I'd be interested to see what the dealer charges or shop a charge for this job. Because, you know, you think, oh yeah, spark plugs, those will be easy. Not that uh, I think this job has been that bad so far. But compared to some cars, it's definitely a lot more work. There we go. So we got those vent hoses off now. Now, go ahead and remove the vent hoses from where it sits on the plenum. So you got a bracket right here uh, that attaches to the plenum and it comes over here to the uh, right cylinder bank or uh, bank one. So there's two 10 millimeter fasteners in here. Woo -hoo. So far, what I've learned on this job is there's just a lot of hidden stuff. I shouldn't have to remove that bracket, I don't think. We'll see. I don't see anything else in the way there. Okay, we're looking good so far. Relatively speaking, of course. You can always be surprised. So it looks like there's a series of bolts here, uh, tiny T20s that we're going to have to remove. Great little size, super, well, I wouldn't say it's super easy to strip it out, but there's always that risk. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and remove them. I have no idea how many there are. I just see them everywhere, and they're in kind of crappy plots and spots. Looks like you might be able to use a regular hex driver on there, but I don't know. All right, I gotta look at this objectively here. So I'm only looking to pull off this piece. So I just gotta find all the T20s associated with it. And it looks like they're actually all in a pretty nice spot. Fairly visible. Which always makes me happy. All 
don't know about you guys, but when I'm working on a car, you know, I kind of hate playing. I hate playing the game Where's Waldo with a fastener, you know what I mean? Probably gonna be one more. Yep, right there. Here we go. Just said I hate playing the game Where's Waldo. I'm trying to find a freaking fastener, but lo and behold, that one sort of up against the firewall. So it looks like there's um, one, two, three. It looks like there's four Torx fasteners. You got these eight millimeters here. And I think that's all that actually holds the plenum to, or the upper plenum to the lower plenum. At least that's a path, that's at least how it appears to look. Now it's time to start on doing some of these electrical connectors. Free up some space. Got another expanding rivet here. Freaking love these. Said no one ever. All right, now I'm working on the driver's side of the engine. Um, started doing some electrical, or undoing some electrical connectors. Uh, got an expanding rivet here. Just hoping to get with a pick. Uh, but that's not going to happen. These things really suck. I hate them. Especially when it's installed upside down. It's even better. Yeah. Oh man, alright. I'm seeing a lot of other stuff here too. We got some sort of uh, some sort of check valve down here. Yeah, it's for your uh, brake booster, so that's probably a non-return valve. That's going to have to come off. Uh, we got a bracket here. Another bracket here. That's also going to have to come off. Can't tell if that's been clamped or not. I don't think so. No. So we should be able to take that off without doing anything drastic. Of course, here's another clip, so I want to get myself some room. Make sure that if you're ever prying, you're prying on something solid. I think that's the map sensor right there. Since Chrysler doesn't use mass airflow sensors. At least on no car that I know of. Just trying to be careful with this one. Um, a little another connector down here, well not a connector, but clip, this is sort of holding the brake booster, suction hose in, whatever you want to call it. Man, I got brackets for days on this engine, holy shit.
I'm gonna move the breather hose from this side, I think, or the suction hose from this side. Basically on these, you just gotta break the seal, so. Pick will usually do that. You just kinda run around the circumference. There we go. So that breather hose, and this is the non-return valve right here. I keep saying breather hose, it's not a breather hose, it's a suction hose for your brake booster. Suction hose, probably easier just to remove it from the non-return valve, which is this thing right here. Make life a little easier. Looks like we got some 10 millimeter fasteners here, so we're gonna move those now. These are just nuts. I doubt they're torqued to anything specific anyway. Common sense tight, but that's why on this stuff you're better off using quarter inch tools because you know how much torque can you honestly put on a quarter inch ratchet before it breaks. So for these smaller fasteners, I've gotten the habit of using quarter inch tools. Plus, obviously, it's a lot easier to get a quarter inch ratchet in there versus a full on three eighths or even a half. All right, so now I'm gonna work on uh, getting the air box off and everything like that. That's not too bad. If you replace an air filter on your Wrangler, then you already know this part of the job. There we go. That was a pain. The only thing that's left is the electrical connector for your throttle body. There is no throttle cable on these, they're uh, electronic throttle modules. It's all electronically actuated. Doesn't require anything on that end. Um, so theoretically, once I take this off, should be able to uh, lift the upper intake plenum uh, out of the engine bay. So hopefully that's all that's required. So it's definitely loose. Missed a couple fasteners. Like I said, first time doing this. Learn as you go.
another damn push rivet. Oh, you fucker. And for reference, I was getting held up on this right here. Attaches to just some stupid bracket that's part of the intake manifold. Oh, there's two of them. There's freaking two of them. Unbelievable. Because, you know, you need two within an inch of each other to hold a harness in place, right? Yeah. does appear all those bolts are encapsulated so far the hard part of this job then you get to take off this foam insulation piece which is falling apart anyway so probably won't be putting that back on either but it looks like we actually have pretty much a straight shot here all the coils, which would be great. So I'm going to go ahead and replace those spark plugs now, and then I'll be back with you in order to put the intake manifold back on. Spark plug replacement is going to be identical on this side, except there's nothing in the way, so it's actually going to be easier. So there's really nothing to explain. Um, it's going to be the reinstallation that we're going to have to go through. And that's going to be the uh, last part of this video. All right, at this point, uh, you know, I've replaced all the spark plugs. I've reinstalled the ignition coils on bank two, which is the left side of the engine or driver's side of the engine. We're going to go ahead and replace these gaskets. They're a little dry, a little oily, a little gross. Uh, the gaskets were like 75 cents a piece, so less than $5. Uh, really makes no sense to ever reuse old gaskets, especially when they're cheap. Uh, but any type of rubber gasket, really want to replace those. If it was like a metal gasket, maybe I can understand reusing it, but not for this. I'm just going to take a lint-free cloth here, kind of clean up some of the dust. Probably should have blocked off the intake ports. Uh, but to be real here, it's not that serious. The correct number, basically here's the diagram right here. It's part number one. Uh, what you would need to order is 051-84562AC. Uh, I've also made the decision here. I will not be reinstalling this heat shielding. I have no idea what the hell the purpose is. To me, it seems like it just sort of attracts dust. It's falling apart anyway. And it's just one more nonsensical thing to deal with when you have to do this job. So, not putting it back on. It's probably for... The reason why I'm also not <coughs> installing this sound deadening crap back in is it's already disintegrating. It was already making a mess on the valve cover. Um, I'm not even sure what the purpose is. I know it has a purpose, probably to decrease sound, but what sound is redeadening I don't know so I'm not putting it back in it, it's a waste of time now we're gonna reinstall the intake manifold hopefully uh, we'll be able to use the leverage from the manifold to get it in place and what I mean by that is you know we got a shit that's sort of blocking the way but I think we can use the intake manifold to sort of leverage this stuff out of the way really what I'm what I'm most concerned with is getting these studs here into their respective bracket and then once I have that done I should be able to just bolt everything down and and you're kind of on the home stretch from that point
slightly at an impasse here. I expected this. I'm just gonna have to use our brains here, not our might. Because what happens when you use your might is you normally break something expensive. And we do not want to do that. There we go. So, what I basically did is I made sure that these two studs and these two studs were still in their bracket, seated. I pushed this side against here, so I was pushing in this direction. And I pushed back on this metal bracket for like the main engine harness connector and it slid into place. So, that's how I did it. And it worked. Hopefully it also worked for you. Alright, so the torque specs on the upper intake manifold bolts here, so there's seven of them. Uh, torque spec is allegedly 8 newton meters and that comes out to 71 inch pounds. So, not a very high torque spec, but I, I wouldn't have expected it to be anyway. I'm going to try to alternate here as much as possible. Now I was using a, a T20 before in order to torque all this or to remove, but these are also 8 millimeter fasteners as well. So I'm just going to use an 8 millimeter quarter inch socket for now just to draw these down. Of course, I got the one in the back here you have to feel for, but. Also, to note, just saw this, they put the torque spec right here on the intake manifold, 7 to 9 newton meters. So right now I'm not really making these too tight, I'm just snugging them down. I got my uh, torque wrench set to actually eight and a half. That's kind of where it wanted to fall in. So you know, again, these are really small fasteners, so uh, you don't have to make these crazy tight. If you install new gaskets, it should just seal on its own without too much additional help. Don't use any type of sealant or anything like that. There's really no need for it. What I'm basically doing is 
try to alternate as much as possible to make sure that everything is torqued evenly. Sometimes if you start on one side and then go to the other side, uh, you'll lose. I had to guess that one in the back there, unfortunately, uh, to where it's located. I couldn't exactly get uh, the torque wrench on it, unfortunately. Uh, now without a series of extensions, and at that point, uh, you're already losing it anyway. So, uh, wasn't really any sense to uh, to try to torque that back. There's no way for me to get to it. So, also when you're done using your torque wrench, just to make sure these things remain accurate, you want to put it at as low a setting. You don't want to store it with some load on it. I'm gonna go ahead and just put some of these uh, breather hoses back on. I believe this is a breather hose here. Uh, one of these is definitely like a fuel tank vent valve. And I'm gonna focus on this side now. Just gonna start plugging in these electrical connectors, putting nuts and things back on that I've removed. And then I'll uh, go back to the other side and wrap everything up over there, put the uh, intake back on. ribbon goes back in. You know, I mold the shit out of it when it came when it came out. That's usually what happens. Got our suction hose for our brake booster. Gotta put that back. So that'd be one heck of a vacuum leak, let me tell you. Would not take much time to figure out what was wrong there. God, I hate these freaking rivets, man. Such a pain. So I'm reinstalling these brackets for now. Even though with the, I don't know, sound denning or whatever you want to call it, there really doesn't seem to be any other purpose for them to be there. Um, I would just rather have them in place, just in case I change my mind later on and want to put the sound denning behind the intake manifold in place. But as it stands right now, I, I don't think I'm going to. Send that one home too. Call it a day. Now we're on the home stretch. Easier to put the ear box in first because it has to line up with these grommets and push it in place. throw in the intake boot. Uh, just a quick note on these clamps. Um, they kind of self-align. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, so if they happen to come completely undone, just make sure you line them back up and you want obviously you know the uh, this section 
pointing up at you. And don't forget, we got our temperature sensor. At least I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Down here, so I want to plug that back in, of course. Should just click into place. And we just drop the intake boot down. That's good there. Got these two 10 millimeter ones right here. And then we have our uh, negative battery terminal that we have to reinstall. That should be that. All right, we're gonna go ahead and give it a start. See how she wants. Much better. 